while back, there was this stupid idea of switching to emulated PLCs. And everyone was like, why would you use a PC? That's stupid. You got a whole new class of bugs that you didn't have before. Well, well it was a question of time. Uh, now we have a whole new class of bugs right on the PLC. And our next two speakers will we'll be presenting a worm that is living on such Siemens PLCs. It doesn't need any PC or x86 architecture to spread. It, it just, just well, well, mums away, away on your infrastructure, infrastructure while you're watching. watching. Please, Please give a warm welcome, welcome and applause to Mike Brüggemann and Ralf Spannenberg. Yes, hello. Uh, sorry for the slight technical problems. We also had to fight with different uh, aspect ratio screens. The laptop has the wrong aspect ratio. The slides are a bit smaller that way. I hope everybody can see everything. First, I'll do the introduction. My name is Ralf Spenneberg. Next to me is Mike Brüggemann, Hendrik. The third speaker unfortunately couldn't come because he was ill, so he'll probably watch us from home during the live stream. We are a small company. One or the other might know us. I've written uh, books earlier. I've written um, in the last years we were changed from the classical training, and nowadays we do a lot of helping, especially about the uh, security, classic uh, Linux security, but also resistance analyzing or pen testing in the de in around debating systems and industrial uh, communication and also RFID transponders where a different um, employee will talk about that tomorrow with me and that's about us. What are we going to talk about? We are talking about industrial uh, controlling. One and a half years ago, we cho chose a family, and because it was interesting to us, Mike wrote a bachelor thesis about that. That's two years ago now, and it was a small and cheap s uh, control system. It was the S7 500. You can buy these devices for 150 euros, nothing great. I think too expensive. The systems are have, depending on the model, about a bit of RAM, a bit of ROM or persistent storage flash. All have an Ethernet connection port and we chose the module with the firmware version 3. Siemens frequently publishes new firmware versions and they will be programmed with TR portal in the version 11, which is for those who have programmed a 7, the most version of the, uh, the latest version of the uh, Step 7 software. And we looked at that and we tried to find uh, loopholes and weak points and write programs that allow to show design problems, especially about the networks uh, with which uh, the networks are built. And to understand that, I want to give you some background information about the PLCs, because it's completely different than what you know, know from a modern computer. The PLC comes with a software, or the PLC, comes with a firmware from the manufacturer, and all manufacturers are the same in that view, and the, and the user writes a piece of software that controls the system and takes over the system controlling. Maybe a traffic light control or the control of a, uh, or a centrifuge or a climate control or anything. And how does that work internally? The systems always work cyclic. So in, in circles, the firmware reads the inputs and outputs. We'll see how an SP uh, PLC looks like. We've seen them, them here. It will read the in and outputs. It will run 
uh, one circle of the program and then it will do some cleanup steps. Communicates with the outside world, with the Ethernet, and then the next uh, program cycle starts. It it's running cyclic. We don't have a project, uh, object oriented programming. We have no great control to stop these cycles, to change how these cycles are going. It's always one cycle that is used. The maximum cycle time is around 150 milliseconds. So once a uh, cycle works longer, they assume it's an error and behave differently. And sometimes they stop. That depends on how they are programmed. To understand how the programming works, that will is programmed in blocks. It's a language that is usual from uh, pr those programming systems. They are programming blocks, which are entrances to the program that is run. Uh, so vergleichbar vielleicht so main function by C. Maybe so like the main function of C where you uh, start the program. Then there are function uh, blocks, which is probably like a class with exactly one method. There are also functions. The difference between functions and function blocks is that a function block semi-persistent speicher hat. That has some semi-persistent storage. If a function is called one in one cycle, everything is deleted for the next cycle, whereas a function block does have some local storage. For example, how many cycles it has been run in. That's the difference between a function and a function block. Functions and function blocks are written by the user. The manufacturer usually brings some his own functions, probably similar to a library, a programming interface. And there are system function blocks and system functions. And additionally, you can also use a database, uh, sort of a binary blob. There's uh, memory that you can access uh, where you can store arbitrary data. And that's uh, comparable to global memory and that's called a data block. And it's programmed in a, using a variety of languages. Um, there's a variety of languages available for programming a PLC that depends on the origin, uh, for example. So uh, people who use electronics uh, will use a, um, a diagram. And then you have like a graphic representation of the program and uh, that results in the software that you can directly flash to the uh, PLC. So uh, you have like uh, a diagram that says if there's one on this input and one on this input, then the output will also be one. And you can also do it in a classical programming language. Uh, it's called structured text. This is what we did because the other, it was kind of weird for us. So we, d we don't have any experience with that. But there's really good reasons to use the other approach. And all the uh, different vendors seem to use a similar approach here. So what did we want to do, or what did we do? We created a warm, and what's the special thing about a warm? We, we know warms from the PC world. The special thing about this warm is that this warm after we uh, infected an, a PLC, we can disconnect the computer and the worm will, without further interaction, uh, spread to the other PLCs. It will find the PLCs, attack them and then uh, copy itself to the PLC. And as soon as it's uh, written to the other PLC, it will activate itself and then start attacking other PLCs from there. And we're going to make a demonstration. And we're going to show that the warm uh, keeps spreading. And that's obvious if you think about it. Because they're just computers, they're just PCs where your program is running. So it's probable 
dass das bei fast allen Industriesteuern funktionieren that wird. This is going to work with any uh, PLCs. It of course depends on the vendor, if there are any defense mechanisms. For example, Siemens does have an, a defense mechanism that can prevent this. Dafür sorgen kann, dass das nicht möglich ist. Um, sie ist halt And nur per Default, vor allem bei den älteren per default, Geräten, the default setting, um, etwa uh, zwei Jahre alt. Especially when you look at these older devices, those are two, two year old. And uh, so you have to enable those. And if you don't enable the setting, then you have the problem we're going to show. So what kind of worm do I need to write? It needs to discover its, its targets, it needs to um, spread, so it needs some kind of mechanism to spread, and it needs to be able to activate itself on the target system, and then we maybe want to do something with the worm. So, th th there needs to be some ma some some payload, some some malware. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what we did. Uh, we're going to look at it later. So this is the background. And now I'm going to give the mic to Mike, <laughs> and uh, he's going to continue. Thank you very much, Rolf. If we want to s find targets, we have to f d uh, have a sign which we didn't discover other PLCs. And with Siemens, that's the port 102. It's always open. I c the user cannot lock it down. And if we find somewhere in a network an open port 102, it's highly likely to be in Siemens PLC. And the idea we had was to implement a port scanner to I in the language, the structured text language, and there are two functions about that. One opens PLC, uh, TCP connections and the other one closes it back down. And here is a uh, documentation. You can see up here in the in, in Turkish place function that creates everything where we have uh, parameters and we can ask whether the connection was successful and down here we um, t have the target destination and the port so from IT you would expect that we call the function and once it's ready it returns with a oh, I was successful in creating this connection or there's an error message it did not work but with PLCs it's a bit different you remember we have a cycle time from 150 milliseconds which we mustn't over the uh, step so this method is asynchronous. so with every cycle we run over this complete construct start at the top call this function and with every cycle we ask did you manage it did you manage it now and if it has we change to a different place in the program code where it will continue to run the virus or the code. A problem that we have is that there is no timeout in this function, so we will never know if there is maybe no target at all. So we have to implement that ourselves. It's quite easy. We just count the circle. Um, how often did this method run? And at a certain stage, in this case 200, we say, oh, that won't work will stop the connection. Important is to understand that even if the, the connection was not created and the, the function that stopped the connection will return with an error message, I wasn't able to create one, but we still have to close it down because otherwise in the background it will always try to create this connection. So after having found a target or not, we can count up the IP address, just the last byte to the top, we always scan a 24, uh, slash 24 network for PLCs, we can also have something different like a list of targets or a complete subnets or m several subnets, you can scan. That's what about the target finding algorithm? So you can find a target with these two methods. And the next thing we would have to look at, how can we put the worm onto a PLC? How do we download the program? And for that, 
One has to understand that the program download usually happens via TCP with these PLCs, and if it's their functions to create a connection, there is a connection to read and or to receive. And so we decided, why don't we implement in this program that protocol? We usually put updates or update the PLCs with. The challenge was the protocol to understand the protocol what that which runs the download. We have a protocol stack. In the bottom there is TCP IP. Above that there are two more protocols, which I'm not going to talk about. It's documented in the internet. If you're interested, you can read it there. And in the top, S7 COM plus, we call it. That's the interesting one. That's the one that runs the download. It's bi a binary program, it's proprietary, so we don't know anything about that. There is no official documentation by Siemens. It differentiates a lot from the previous protocol, like the S7300 or 400. And the latest version, it has already been changed. And at the moment, the virus will not work on the latest firmware versions. However, the, there are the same features. The program transfer, we have to start and stop the transfer, and there are also other features like the change of input and outputs over the network connection. I will talk about of the protocol. So here's just a Wireshark recording of the first messages from the TIA portal, from the development environment, and it basically just says, hi, I'm the TIA portal and I just want to talk to you. And you see how it's structured. You have two protocols I'm not going to talk about. And then there's uh, always uh, 72. And then there's a version number marked in green. And then depending on the version of the PLC, it's one, two, or three. Then there's a length uh, field that you know from other network protocols. And afterwards, there's uh, um, a boundary marker that says, here is the end of the frame. And if the end frame is missing, then we know there's more data. And there's a type, for example, a request or an answer. There's uh, a few zero bytes. And then there's a subtype that describes the further the structure of the message. And there's also a sequence number. And if you look at the uh, message, there are a lot of bytes missing. And if you uh, look at those, uh, then you find A3. Uh, they are some sometimes grouped. And uh, we thought those are kind of uh, suspicious. Uh, so we looked at it. And the A3 always uh, starts a so-called attribute block, which itself has uh, this structure. So you see there's an ID that describes which kind of value it uh, represents. And then there's a zero, which we don't really know what it means. And then there's a data type. In this example, it's a string. And then the length and then the actual value that's supposed to be transmitted. Um, the numbers are somewhat strange. If you look at the protocol and try to understand it, then the lengths don't match because the numbers are uh, uh, represented in a weird way, the 81, for example. And then you look at it, the first bit is set, which means there will be another byte following. So the number of the length is variable. And uh, once you understood this, then you can understand the protocol pretty good. And that's important uh, for, for the basic understanding. So you can uh, change information later. And now we look at the second message. And we uh, just sent a message, uh, I want to talk to you. And now the PLC responds and says, yes, I want to talk to you too. And the only thing we're interested in is the 25th byte, which is a random byte. And on every connection, uh, this is chosen randomly. And this is probably uh, a simple replay protection. So we can't just record and then replay it to the PLC. So what we had to do is we look at the byte and then flip the first bit. So we add 
80 hex, and then we have to um, put this on the 23rd byte position in every uh, message that we send. So we can just record the communication between the tire portal and the PLC, and just remember to uh, do this step, and then we can just replay the uh, communication and see how it reacts. Uh, so we can use this to upload software. So for us, important, the download block message has the same structure that I just described. There's just two more important information. One is the block type. Uh, we just saw the list earlier. There's five or six different ones. And the block number, which is just uh, some, some sort of uh, memory slot. So just uh, two memory slot one or two, whatever you want to download. And afterwards, there's lots of attribute blocks. They're pretty long. And here are some examples of the attribute blocks in one of these download uh, block message. For example, the last modified date of the program, which language it was programmed in, the code, which is what the PLC actually executes. Um, part of these attribute blocks are very important. For example, the code, you need the code to actually run the program. But others are just stored on the PLC so the TIA program can recover it later even if you don't have it on your computer. So as an engineer, you can always connect to the PLC and ask it which programs are stored, and you get a list including source code and everything you might want to know about it. So you can look at a few things which might help an attacker. One of the things is the data is redundant. I already told you there's the memory slot, block number one, but it's also transmitted via an attribute of its own, and this information is redundant. So the interesting question is which one of these are actually used in the PLC or in the tire uh, portal. And the interesting thing is that both of them are used. The PLC uses the uh, memory block. For example, 537, and then the uh, PLC will store it to 537. But maybe I don't change the other uh, location. For example, I just let it uh, stored. I just let the value one persist, and then the tire portal is going to use that. So now I can hide code on the PLC because once an engineer will uh, have some suspicion, it will connect to the PLC. It will. Uh, want to know what it does and what are what's stored on it and it will get all the program blocks but has the block one twice which of course isn't the same uh, block because in reality it's stored somewhere else on the plc but the tire portal doesn't really know uh, what to do with that and only displays one so we can hide parts of our program on the plc and another thing is uh, there's also redundancy in the code. It's stored in two variants, uh, zipped XML on the left. And we can also see there's it contains comments as well. So it results in the original source code if you want to. But it also stores bytecode that the PLC actually executes. And if, if I know how to download this, I can exchange the XML text to something random that maybe looks unsus unsuspicious. But the reality is that the PLC executes some other code that the engineer never sees. So that's a nice feature for a worm. Um, there's another thing you can uh, just leave out some of the blocks. For example, the XML source code. You don't have to include it, and you don't have to return that. And the main thing is it reduces the amount of data that we have to download. And that at that point, we have understood how a message looks, how length uh, fields work, and how we 
forge messages. We, we've managed to uh, understand the uh, anti-replay feature. And what we have to do is now um, implement the program download using the uh, TIA protocol. And that's just uh, a bit of work we have to do. And then you download the virus. And now all, all the messages and the finished program is being downloaded. And we take it and store it in one of the data blocks that we have available. And afterwards, we uh, upload it using our own tool. We can't do it with the TIA portal, obviously, and then we infect the, the PLC, the first PLC. So it's about how to infect the first PLC. So we wrote the, the, the worm using the tire portal, wrote it to a PLC, sniffed using Wireshark, and then um, with the knowledge we had, adapted it, and then uh, built that into our worm. And we're going to see how that works in a moment. So we have finished the first few uh, features. So the last two are still missing. How do we activate it? We've downloaded it. But how do we actually run it? And there's a function of the PLC which uh, helps. One of those OBs is comparable, of course, uh, to a main function. But, but we can have more than one of these main functions. So uh, the idea is to download an additional OB, and the PLC sees there's uh, another one, and it executes it just after the first one. So the original software on the PLC is still running. So activation is built in. We don't have to do much. So we also have to create a payload so we can think about what we want to do, what we want to do. denial of service is a possibility, so we can stop the PLC, we can change the output, we have always the TCP function available, so we can create a new c uh, connection to a CNC server, we have pr create a proxy, we can do whatever we want. We have the complete language available. So we have all four points and the virus should work. So we have created a demo. I will play the attacker with my laptop. We'll infect the first PLC, then I'll just attach my laptop and the virus will connect itself among these uh, PLCs. And in the end, they will all connect back to my laptop as a CNC, a command control server. So, once we have the image, here we have the four PLCs. These are the PLCs we can see here. Uh, if we go closer to it, here, there, this is how they look. We have the Ethernet port here. Here are input and outputs. And here we have 220 volts and some more input outputs. We have four of those connected together. And I'll disconnect the Ethernet uh, part of three of those, so they are not connected anymore. So, um, jetzt ich also drei so I disconnected three. The fourth one is connected to the switch up here with the, uh, with the laptop and Mike will now inject the worm. So the first thing I'll do is I'll start the c command and control server which they connect themselves to. So the it's now running and waiting for connections. The next step, I've written a small script which initiate uh, the infection of the first PLC. So I enter the IP address of the first PLC. You have to know that one. So it runs now. The PLC has already switched down, the virus is updated now, and the PLC is running again now. We see no difference from the program, this lights. So the original program is continuing to run, although the virus is active by now. So the command and control server should have a connection now. Yes, the first PLC has connected back to it. Now we disconnect the laptop. Uh, the, laptop the laptop is disconnected, and we connect a second PLC. I hope it did we didn't wait too long. So 
we will see the first one to connect the second. It will be switched off to the second PLC. And it's just a matter of time. Oh, we'll see, it's l turn off, the lights are have stopped blinking and the virus is uploaded and it's running again. So... Now, that was the one we have infected initially, and to see that that's not the one that's doing all the infe uh, following infection, I'll disconnect it, it doesn't have any network connection anymore, and I'll connect the other two. So the worm that has already spread to the second, oh the first one's already off, it's running again. So the one on the bottom right uh, has to come, we have spaced the IP addresses so that we have some time between them, it just worked. So we know how long the worm is scanning, so I hope it will just work. There, it's off. 200 milliseconds, and they have spaced 50 milliseconds, and it's running again. So now all four of them are infected, so I'll connect these and the laptop. So in a few seconds, they should all connect to our command and control server. The first one, the second one. Others may have been already ah, been there. There we are, there are all four of them. Um, uh, now we have a connection to the command and control server in the background while the uh, light is stop, uh, running. So maybe let's just stop all of the lights. Was it zero or one? Let's try. Oh, <laughs> they are stopped. Uh -oh. Let's turn off the light. Turn, make it dark. Um, just turn on one light. Oh, all of them. <laughs> no, we could use it as a flashlight. Yes, what else can we do? Also we can also choose one, one so can the one. command and control server can do some things. Mistyped. There is an M missing. That's the excitement when you're in front here. So the one at the top is running. So that one's working again. That's the one that has digital input outputs. The others have a re relays. So we have two different models, different firmware stands, uh, versions. So all versions 1 to 3. The version 4 um, we'll talk about in a second. Can we show anything else? Ah, proxy, yeah. ah yes, the proxy. So, I don't know who was... At the Black Hat last year, or watched the um, uh, show, some have showed that you can implement a proxy, a Sox proxy, on one of the older machines, so we have developed the same. If someone else can do it, we can do so too. So we can also run an NMAP scan and see that the parts are scanned. So the PLC is running the scan. There's the SOX proxy and it will run the network scan. Because the connection is back connected back to us, so we can also run through a NAT firewall, so we can scan it out the network behind the proxy through the proxy. Also, um, That's also um, working great. Another thing, I hope get clear, the protocol that's running here by Siemens is, to this point, is not documented, nor is there any open source solution we know of, or any software solution we know of, where we can create these functions. So Mike mostly just tried to figure out how it works which bytes and which bits in the system no, works which, and especially the number. And there is another byte, and the number se itself is only seven bits. It has needed a lot of time to really understand that. So, 
Right, so now you want to turn it off now, and now they're really off. And they're turned off in a way that pulling the plug is not going to work, it's not going to be enough. So now they're all turned off, and I turn back the power, I turn the power back on. But we see there's only the LEDs are still too off, so it's not enough to just uh, remove the um, the power. It's a feature. Note that we did not have to use any vu vulnerability. Everything is by design. Das Protokoll gibt uns diese the protocol enables us to, in the default setting, it doesn't give us any opportunity or doesn't have any protection. Um, you can turn it on, but the, in the default setting it's off, so someone has to uh, use its tier portal on a, on a programming uh, PC. Or if they have an, a web server enabled, then you can use that to re-enable them. Okay, so this is enough for our demonstration. So we go back to the slides. And of course, it's interesting to see what the PLC actually uh, did to influence the, uh, the what the WARM did to influence the PLC. So it uploaded another. Uh, main block, which means you have to stop the program, which of course is also locked. And depending uh, how this machine is uh, controlled, then of course this is going to be very, um, um, this is going to be very uh, noticeable. So uh, an alarm might go off, or if it. <laughs> Now you can improve that by not uploading a new main block, but uh, extending an existing block, which is also a feature of the Siemens PLC. You can um, manipulate running programs during runtime without stopping them. So you have to implement in the virus, of course, download the, uh, the, the running program, download it, and then manipulate it, and then upload it back. Uh, but it's uh, technically possible. Uh, of course, it uh, needs a bit of RAM, uh, 38 kilobytes of RAM, and 220 uh, kilobytes of persistent memory that we needed, which is a lot because it's 77 percent of the smallest model. But that's of course because we have a lot of features in the uh, control server. If we know exactly which uh, malware we want to execute, then we can reduce that by uh, a noticeable amount. And of course, we have to uh, keep uh, keep remembering the cycle time. Uh, right now, we need about uh, seven milliseconds, which is about what we expect. Uh, all of the functions that I explained are asynchronous. Uh, asynchronous. <laughs> and how do you remove the worm? The easiest uh, way is to do a factory reset. Uh, all the user supplied uh, program is being deleted, or you just override the block, uh, the OB uh, that the warm is stored. This is not going to be uh, enough to remove the warm. And of course, the uh, TIA portal sees the virus, so uh, we see different blocks right here. Uh, it's the original uh, program from the engineer, and then he can um, ask. Which uh, what is currently stored in the PLC and currently now is everything is green, but down here we see the the, the circle has changed. Uh, not something has been added, so we can use that to to hide it uh, using the techniques I uh, already explained. But another way would be to change the attribute blocks. So if you uh, have some strange uh, values in there, then the tire portal is going to crash. And there's no way to. And the engineer doesn't have any uh, ability to uh, check what the, program, uh, what the device is actually doing. So let's talk about protection now, how, how to protect yourself from that. So that's a big question. 
There's different uh, possibilities how, how you could implement this. One of them would be not to connect them to the network in the first place. Um, but other than that, uh, the Internet of Things with the old uh, version of those PLCs, that's just not a good idea. And the, those that are just two years old, I'm counting as old here. So it's just a bad idea. And uh, in addition to the warm that we've uh, shown you, we did find uh, real vulnerabilities for several of the vendors. So. Uh, that allowed us to crash the system or do other things. That's not just Siemens. It's all the vendors have those problems, and especially the older systems. And the vendor response is really uh, terrible. So we had really good contact with Siemens. We uh, tell them there's a vulnerability, and they react in a reasonable amount of time and try to fix it and patch it. And then they also see the problems and they actually have improved in their newer models. But uh, other vendors such as Mitsubishi uh, took half an hour, uh, half a year just to contact Mitsubishi. And then we contacted them using the ICS cert in the, in the USA. And we uh, sent, sent them a curl call that uh, could be used to just uh, do the uh, attack. And then we uh, were asked to um, to send them all the information, which tools we used and how we can can uh, replicate that. And we said, well, there's the curl call. That's all you need to know. And then it took another four months until they said, uh, yeah, we're going to patch it, but there's not going to be any update for the old systems. So it's just going to be patched with the, the ones that are going to be bought from now on. So they are very similar to those PLCs we have here. I uh, have integrated Ethernet, and they may control something in your house, uh, maybe a, a climate. Uh, um, and that's, of course, problematic. And many of the vendors try to uh, protect their systems. And the firmware version that we have here does have some sort of access prote uh, pr protection. And we can ha we have two different uh, versions here, um, write-only on uh, read-write, and this is going to protect from the warm. So I'm not going to be able to uh, replace the program on the PLC. So just by turning on the write protection, I can't uh, copy a program to the PLC, and I can I can still read it, but I can and I can of course change the in and outputs, but I can't change the program. Um, so what are we going to do um, to improve the security? So first of all, this of course should be enabled by default, and the users should be notified that these features exist. So we need awareness. Uh, for the users of those PLCs. And so they need to be aware that what they have is really a small PC, which has the same problems that any PC has. Um, so we're trying to solve those for the last 25, 30 years in the PC world. And in, in this case, the, the firewall might be another layer. So we, we connect to the PLC, so uh, simply by disallowing this on the firewall. Uh, this would improve the situation. Or is there another, the another question would be, are other vendors also affected? Uh, so what do, do we need? We need, of course, Ethernet connection. And we need to be able to, um, to uh, have a way to uh, upload the program via TCP. And then we need programmable, TC programmable TCP function on the PLC itself. So some of the vendors, uh, Siemens, Mitsubishi, Schneider, uh, those are the gray ones are those that are th that have a ethernet connection or provide one as a as a additional accessory and that do have tcp function in their uh, plc uh, language there's only the movicon easy which is something very small and all the others and those are the ones that do have TCP functions in their programming language. So, in essence, all those variants do have the possibility to implement one of those, a worm that attacks another PLC from the PLC. 
Uh, whether it's in fact possible, we, we, we don't know. But what we do know is that the S7 300 and 400 uh, should be uh, re really easy because those protocols are uh, well understood and the access protection is uh, available but if it's turned off of course. Uh, what we also know is that the uh, 1500 and the version 4 uh, it does not work. Uh, the protocols have changed and they just look different and the big problem is we can't just so I do have uh, 1,200 and I uh, just uh, use version 4, that just doesn't work. It's hardware version 3, so I can't install that, so I have to buy new PLCs, which is maybe part of their business model, I don't know. But you maybe not, it may not be possible to do a firmware upgrade if you don't buy the newer hardware. Das also dazu. Um, tja. Das heißt, das, was wir in so tun werden, ist what we're going to do in the future is we're going to look at different vendors. We have one from Mitsubishi, we do have one or two from Schneider Electric. And what would be really interesting is we only looked at Ethernet. And those of you who really use those machines, they know that the PLCs uh, internally use a lot of field bus communication. So there may be one that acts as a gateway uh, between the gateway and the uh, between the field bus and the Ethernet system. So it would be interesting to infect the gateway, for example, with one of the software that we wrote, and the infection would propagate using field bus. I don't know if that works, but I don't know. But this is what we're going to look at in the future, and that's all I have to say for today and we would be open to questions. Thank you very much for the great talk. And the demigod was with you. If you have any questions, please stand up behind the microphones. Do we have a question from the internet? Yes, we do. We have a number of questions from the internet. Many are about the protection things. Can you just switch? Can you switch the security features on and off? Could you connect them from behind the worm, from the device itself, and do all connections that have deactivated that by default? Yes. I don't know whether that's with all of them, at least with Siemens, it's like that. The standard connection, they are not activated. And yes, I know they can be deactivated by the protocol, but I do need the password for that. So I can just directly use the password. So it's con protected by a password, and the programmer has to have its own possibility to switch them off. So the protections feature can be switched off by the over the protocol. So the question left. Have you looked whether the uh, crash is exploitable? So um, can you connect from the uh, uh, PLC to the laptop of the engineer, the programmer? No, we have not looked at that. You can always just look at one thing at a time. Do we have any additional questions? Yes, signal angel questions from the internet. How can you connect to the network of the PLCs? Do you do I have to be there and connect with my laptop or is there internet? So one idea might be I sell a new machine and I sell something I connect another machine which has the warm pre-installed on the PLC and it's connected to the network that way. So I don't have to really have physically access to it. I just have to have one infected SPS in the system, in the industrial system. And that can be a component in a machine or a device that is by the manufacturer or during the transportation has been infected. Microphone from the links. Mike at the front left. Hi, I would have a question about the programs running on them. Are there any privilege uh, systems between the different program blocks in any PLC, which is a standard technology in laptops or no, mobile computers, and I know that the, the system is 20 years old. We haven't noticed anything. 
so far. So once you're there as a program, you can run anything you want to. You don't need to look at the other blocks. Anyway, I am the program, I'm running, and I do whatever I want to. So it might be interesting to look how the device is run to read at the source code of the other programs, to which could help you understand the system. Yeah, that's no problem. Mike has written software that he can read the code of the PLC over the Ethernet, and we use that to understand how the protocols are working. And we have looked at the usage of the PIA portal and looked at what it's doing. And with that worm, we can read the other blocks and read the other PLCs and collect those information. Another small information about the infection of a field bus, how I understand the system. The first thing you do is write a bootloader for the field bus devices. Nobody wants to use the JTAG adapter to that. Microphone hinten rechts. Microphone on the break, right. Wird eine Infektionskontrolle durchgeführt? Is there an infection control? Do you look if the infection is already controlled? So otherwise they will reboot again and again. So that would be surprising if all the uh, cranes crash and the conveyor belts work. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, we do that. I have just another main object block uh, we download and what the virus does before it downloads itself is to ask is this block already used and either it has an error message or there's the answer yes it's there and then it'll just stop the infection so if we saw it once all the PLCs have been infected they are not disconnected okay. yes. So all of that is just a proof of concept. So we aren't sure how far we want to publish some of the code any anyway at a future point. So because we know that's the problem. But at the moment, this is a proof of concept to, to show others that there are these problems. So that's one of the biggest problems here. Those in the room here, if we come from the PC er area, so especially here, we know really well how good this how important the security of uh, net, um, the systems and the software, especially in the industrial systems where they implement these systems, the creator of these machines who write the programs, they usually don't know what access protection is, what all the other protection methods mean, they sometimes exist, and what should be allowed and what's possible to do. And we talked with the ma car manufacturer and they talked to him how, how he works with the security and he says, of course that's uh, the the network is, is changed from the office. We are afraid of the fabrication network. So the idea there was, we don't want the we want to protect the office network from the industrial network. So because they were afraid the industrial network connects to the um, trans malware on the uh, home net oh, of the office network. So every connector, uh, every company who enters a new c machine to the network wants to uh, have access to the network to co uh, continue his maintenance program. So they know that and as a runner of the, c the network, you don't know who is in that network at all, which of the uh, connections are used at the moment because turn plugging off the plug is will not be used and w won't work. So I know somebody who has created a new hall and he can change the LED light on his the smartphone. The smartphone is connected with a server somewhere in the internet. The network also connects it to that server and it connects it. And in Mallorca he can turn on and off the light. In a company hall. The light system probably cost 50, 60,000 euros, so that's the and security sensibility is not available there, or hardly known. So we have to talk about the security in that area. So 
Any other questions? There is another question from IRC and one from the hall. So, several people want to know whether you could uh, do distributed connection or even no connections. <coughs> Uh, the, the connection, you probably could buy Raspberry Pis cheaper than that, uh, otherwise it's a proxy server, you could implement that, you could implement, you can surf over that, no problem, with the normal problems with the speed. Another question from the hall, uh, I recently read that the uh, Honey project had Honey Nets with the industrial project. Have you asked them that? Could you emulate it? No. As far as we know, there is no emulation uh, available. There are emulations, but they are not free. Any further questions? One more from the hall and one from the signal angel and then the time is over. Just another question about the future, our tendency to do code signing, maybe somewhere in the future to protect, to implement. We don't have it in the PC area, so why? So, I mean, I hope, I hope that what we do here is going to work towards that. So we know Siemens pretty well, and if we from time to time maybe Open. We don't want to put Siemens on the uh, stocks. Siemens does a lot to try and protect the security of these systems, but they're also a burnt uh, child during because of Statnet. But otherwise, it's code signing. Many of these industrial systems is those that are in the field, the computational power is just not there to check the sig signature or to actually implement a s encrypted connection. So that maybe co will come in a future system. So a lot happens. Our worm does not work uh, at the moment on the latest system. But and Siemens promised us that, that some of that is due to security implementations they have on, the, uh, on them. But yeah. Yes. Something happens. It's getting better, but the large problem is the Internet of Things is arriving now. Industrial 4.0 arrives now, and there are a lot of industrial systems that have 20 or 30 year old SPS. So we have to make sure that they cannot just be used in uh, industri Industry 4.0 nowadays with those because the danger is far too large that this, uh, syst those functions can be used abroad. So another short question from the Signal Angel. Yes, the question is, is this feature used actively? Is there, do you know whether anybody uses it? We don't know that. that. I hope not. You have been listening to PLC Blaster. This talk was...